Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a podcast that stands with Ukraine. I, I appreciate we normally kind of do a joke at the front, but I think we needed to say that, didn't we? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, do, I don't know what lighthearted joke I can make of the current situation, if that's okay. I don't think they're, no, um, we'll get to it in our main story, I assure you. But yeah, I mean, a bit of a serious opening. Sorry about that. Sometimes that's what covering the news uh, will require. So how are you, Rob? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not not bad. Um, uh, I guess, uh, well, 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 we'll get to it in our main story, as we said. Maybe we'll talk a bit about our feelings, but, you know, it, it does very much feel like something that's much closer to home right now. So I guess my anxiety level is slightly higher than usual, but um, yeah. Uh, I think we should probably just head on into the normal headlines, then we can cover that in the main story. So first up from the Metro, a failure of leadership. What's that about, Rob? Yeah, so this is the main story. This is the story I wish I was covering tonight and the one that's kind of been a running theme. Um, But last time we left you on the cliffhanger of Boris Johnson and the Sue Gray report and what was going to happen there. Um, And in the end, it turned out to be a bit of a damp squib, to be honest. Uh, we've got the the report was meant to be published by Sue Gray, and it's meant to have quite a lot of details in it. As happened, the Metropolitan Police said there was so much stuff in the report that might need to be investigated by them. Sue Gray couldn't publish that stuff until the Met had had a chance to have their say and essentially decide whether people should be prosecuted, among them the PM. Uh, so Sue Gray was forced to publish a like a redacted or reduced version of the report. It was about 12 pages long, in which she was able to say that there was, as the Metro said, a failure of leadership at Downing Street, and there were certain... Uh, sort of decisions that were made that didn't seem to go in line with COVID law, but it was just sort of vague enough and there was no sort of knockout punch, which meant that Boris Johnson was able to wriggle out of it. And it seems, um, at least in the short term, that that big sort of momentum we had from about December all the way through January to the start of February, where everybody thought, oh, Boris is in real trouble here and he's going to lose his job. I think that's fizzled out by now. And even current events to one side of the main, main headline that we'll talk about later, uh, I would say that has been the feeling since the Sue Gray report has come out, that everybody feels that Boris Johnson is safe for now or safe until the latest local election. He's The only other wor- thing that's worth mentioning during that is Boris Johnson's apology to the House of Commons was, I, I thought it was not so much a, an apology, more of like a party political speech. He was quite uh, combative in the House of Commons and even essentially accused Keir Starmer of failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile for um, you know for his offences, something that is just blatantly not true. Keir Starmer was director of public prosecutions, and when everything came out about Jimmy Savile and what had happened, and that there had been some failure to prosecute him in the past, Keir Starmer, in that role, apologised for the failure of the legal system in the UK to prosecute Jimmy Savile at the time. However, at no point was Keir Starmer a lawyer directly involved in any of those cases, and that was clearly the inference that Boris Johnson was trying to make in those claims and it led to those claims being shared more widely online something people said was like a by a far right wing topic to spread there were groups that felt emboldened by that and that led to Keir Starmer being hounded outside of the House of Commons by such a group and he had to be protected by police and walked away that certainly was a bad look for Boris Johnson so it's it's not over the Sue Gray report turned out to not be the knockout punch but there's still these investigations to go and depending on how those tap plan out if the Prime Minister is issued with a fine or it's found out he can break the law, does that undermine his position? You know, by quite, I think I can't think of a Prime Minister in living memory that's been able to get away with breaking in the law while they're in office. Um, but if there's anybody who could do it, it's it's probably Boris Johnson, who, when he's been interviewed on numerous occasions, has refused to say whether he'll resign if it's proved that, you know, if he is charged and it's proved that he broke COVID law. As you alluded to at the start of uh this discussion. It's kind of been overshadowed this week by our main story, which has been kind of a stay of execution, I think. Maybe one thing to mention now is the polls, because if we look at them, there's not been a massive resurgence. There's a slow trend up for Conservatives, but it's still a good 6% lead for Labour. So when we last spoke, which is over two weeks ago now, it was Labour 40% to Conservative 33%. Now it's Labour 40% to Conservative 34%. There's not really been that kind of bounce back that you would expect. So I think the people whose opinions shifted because of this are probably understanding of the fact that right now there's another crisis to deal with and maybe swapping our leader right now is not not the thing to do. 
but it hasn't changed the overall feeling towards Conservatives. I think that is significant because there's been a lot of crises that Boris Johnson has had a small dip and then recovered once it's over, he's been able to bluster his way out of it. Now, as you said, that that gap, even though it's closing slightly, the fact that Labour are consistently in the lead in the polls and have been able to maintain that lead might mean that for some people this was the, you know, the last straw for them and Boris Johnson, even if Boris Johnson decides that he's going to stay in power. Um, as I mentioned last episode, maybe the real test for him will be the local council elections and what happens in that phase if the Conservatives suddenly find out they're coming third in those council elections to Labour and the Lib Dems if they have a disastrous one like Theresa May did, then Boris Johnson isn't an electoral, he's, he, he's not successful at the ballot box. He's not doing very well for you at PMQs and he's, you know, he's got a bad, he's living a bad impression as leader of the party. That's when the Conservatives might want to be a bit more ruthless and decide to get rid of him. But for now, everybody seems to be um, keeping their knives behind their backs and just, you know, waiting to see what happens. And I, and I think that's certainly going to carry on for the uh, next foreseeable months, unless, unless, like I say, the, the Met police suddenly slap him with an incredibly big fine or find him to be really at fault. That might be the next big thing as well. It might be a threat to Boris Johnson's leadership um, of the Conservative Party. It's very much a kind of push down the road for now uh, because of both current events and the fact that we're waiting on that police report. So watch this space, I guess. We'll cover it as and when it happens. So our next headline from The Telegraph, Bonfire of Covid Rules. What's that about, Rob? Uh, yeah, I just thought it was worth mentioning in passing that of, as of this Thursday, um, most of the traditional COVID rules that we've had in place since the start of the pandemic, so things like mandated wearing of face masks, free lateral flow tests, uh, stuff like social distancing, that is no longer the law as required by government in, in a lot of places. Uh, this was something that Boris Johnson forced through maybe to a little bit of disquiet amongst those in the Labour benches, not that they wanted to stop rolling back these COVID laws. They wanted to know what the medical backing was, just because you've got, we're probably one of the first countries to completely do away with those laws and not have them mandated in that sense. So it's certainly a bit of a gamble when it comes to that. Uh, and personally, I think it's one thing that Boris Johnson feels he has to do to shore up that kind of right flank of his party. He's he got very unpopular in his own party for allegedly breaking those COVID rules and protocols. Um, and there were other voices on the back benches that also saying that he was too tough with those COVID rules in the first place. And when was he going to get rid of them? Getting rid of those rules now does silence that wing of the party slightly um, and makes his position maybe a little bit more secure within the Conservatives. But I almost feel that this is a move that's been done to but just the Conservative Party rather than the health of the nation. Like getting things, getting rid of things like the requirement for isolation when you say that you're positive for, you know, you've, you've tested positive for COVID. Uh, that's something that I know a lot of people have just had a look at and anecdotally said, you know what, I'm still going to, I'm still going to follow the rules. The science hasn't changed on that. It's just that the government isn't mandating it anymore. Specifically on that point, one of my friends was self-isolating due to having a positive test as they shut everything down and got like a final email halfway through their isolation period saying, sorry, uh, you don't have to isolate anymore. I guess this is a goodbye from Test and Trace kind of thing. Like very weird that we're like at that point where it's definitely still out there. Numbers are still high. Um, I think I, I think I'm right in saying I, I haven't been following the numbers as much as religiously as we all were in 2020. But I, I, my understanding is that deaths are kind of at the same level they were so it is kind of a more background number but that the infection of like you know you talk to people from other countries and they're like absolutely ridiculous what your in, your infection numbers are no one no one wants to travel to the uk so i think there is you know <laughs> that, that there's still a strong differing of opinion between various people and it is interesting to see how other countries see us in doing this because it seems you know i think when america kind of cut back on a load of stuff last yeah, we, you know, we were going, oh, well, that's a bit ridiculous. We're still under these rules here. But now we're kind of going that same way. And and at some point, you do have to say the rules are over and we're, we're coming out of it. But and I guess in some ways, the rules are now kind of in line with what people are actually doing, because none of it has been enforced for a long while. The people wearing a mask on public transport, it seems to be the same people, it's the same rough number. So I don't think the fact that the government changed this rule has changed people's opinions. People were already in those camps, as it were. So... Yeah. And I mean, like working in a hospital, we still have to follow the hospital rules, which are obviously going to be stricter for, for a period of time. Um, but it is going to be a bit weird, I think, when we kind of you know, fully remove everything. But I think most places I've been to now still understand that people are going to be trepidatious about going out and about 
for the first time, especially people who've been locked in for longer, you know, people who had to shield or self-isolate for longer may be in a position where this is their first proper time out since 2020. Um, so I think it's going to still be a long process for people to get back to normal. Though the one thing I find weird is how we've so politicised masks, because we know that um, uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, were very good at mask wearing due to, uh, historically, they had, um, well, the original SARS, which is why this is SARS-CoV-2. And so you'd see people on the train and, and people, you know, people would sometimes be like, oh, why are they wearing masks on the train? You know, thinking the inverse of what it was, which is they have a cold and they don't want to spread the cold to you. But people seeing them on the train wearing the mask thought that they were wearing the mask because London was dirty or something like this, which is not at all the case. But I'm sure on this podcast, go back to 2020, I bet I was like, oh, you know, I think mask wearing will just become a normal thing. I think maybe for some people, you know, if I have a cold, I should wear a mask. That seems sensible to me. But I don't know if that message has got into the gen population at large. I think it's the kind of people who are wearing masks now are the people who might wear masks in the future when they have a cold or the flu or whatever. Although I have noted, I don't know, and again, working in hospital, maybe that's why it's different. But like when I've been like, oh, I'm not feeling well, people have been just like, stay at home. That's been nice. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is a slightly better understanding of sickness and not coming in and spreading your illness to other people, which was something that seemed a, almost a uniquely British concept in the way that sickness day, I mean, it's, it's a conversation for another day and how sickness days are given out and how you apply for them. But there did seem to be a culture with England of this, like, you got the sniffles? Ah, it's fine, come into work. And now, like I say, it would seem madness that even with the flu, I would want to come in and be inconsiderate to my colleagues like that and spread it all around. It's like, nah, if I could just, particularly now working from home is such a, a, a thing. If I can work from home, if I've got a cold, why wouldn't I do that to protect my office friends and I can work just as well from home as I can? And things. So yeah, there might be those few little changes going on. But as we've said, as the story says, as for now, the government is trying to move from to a position they've called it of, of living with COVID. And I understand that is definitely the position that we want to get to in the future. We can't just, we can't isolate forever. But the big question is when and and if the scientific evidence backs that up, and I think that's maybe the, the one big question people still have about why the government decided this was the time to go ahead with it and, and not now. And, no, sorry, and not later. They certainly do seem to be out of step with the majority of the rest of the world in when they've decided to uh, do away with most of those rules. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess the only other thing I don't think we've touched on is uh, what's happening with testing. So there's this kind of weird catch-22 where, so testing is no longer going to be free for the average person on the 1st of April. So I think the NHS, etc., will still have their own ways of getting test people because essential workers will still get free tests. But essentially, if we stop testing in the level we have, then we're not going to know what the infection level is at all, which is always, again, another one of these things where we knew this would have to happen at some point, but possibly we're doing this a bit too early, especially if another variant comes by and we don't see it coming because we don't have that data that we've been relying on up until now. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very interesting point. And like, I think Boris Johnson was very clear in his speech that he said if new variants come along, they might reassess the rules so nothing's off the table it's not the end of covid forever but it does seem how we've got through the delta variant at least the government feels that they can live with it and, and move on but yes our, our warning systems might not be so yeah on tune if we don't have that that mass testing program We've put off talking about our main story for as long as we can. Uh, I think we have to dive into what is quite a, well, I mean, as we said up front, I think there's some feelings going on what's, uh, about the, this story. I'll read the headlines. I'm sure you know what it is, given what we've already said. But from the Times, a dark day for Europe and in the mirror, get out. What's this about, Rob? This is the story. I don't know where you've been if you haven't heard about it, but this is the story that uh, Russia uh, has invaded the Ukraine and is currently uh, at war, basically. Uh, it's yeah, an incredibly big moment, particularly that we're seeing armed conflict uh, within Europe. I think it's the first time since we had like since like Yugoslavia that we have had a conflict on this scale. And but of course the geopolitical consequences are are far wider, and that is a big reason why the whole world is taking uh, notice of what's going on here because you've got the potential side of two superpowers going into a, a proxy war, and if anything spreads outside of Ukraine, that's when you get a real danger of stuff kicking off. So yeah, that's why it's such a big story. Um, it's. It's a very big one to kind of take in all at the same time. So what I'm going to try and do is like look at the look at the long term reasons first, and then go into some of like the short term consequences of what's happened, and then hopefully think about what what comes next and and how people are responding to the crisis around the world. Yeah, no, I think that's probably the the best thing uh, to do. Uh, 
we need to break this down. A lot has happened. And I think the other thing is to say up front, um, this is a very, uh, I forget the phrase they use on the news, but this is a rapidly changing story worth saying. We, we, we can only really report on what's happening now. Um, uh, for the obvious reason that you don't know, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's a, there's a lot of misinformation I've seen going around, especially on Twitter. A general reminder that this is a good time to be double checking and triple checking sources. The BBC is, as we've said before, is very good for this kind of thing. There are obviously other major newslets out there, um, but the BBC is the one we have access to easiest in the UK, and uh, they won't generally share something unless it's been definitely corroborated so uh, it's probably a good place to be looking because a, a lot of stories have been flying around some of them not really relevant um you know someone sees something in russian on a website translates it and goes oh such and such is happening and you're like i don't really know if this is makes any sense for this story but anyway um yeah just a general warning up front i guess take everything with a pinch of salt if it's not been corroborated how did we get here i guess is the, the long-term view people might have seen some youtube videos in 2014 when uh, russia first did a made some moves into areas in Ukraine, but it's only in the last few days that they've launched a full-scale invasion into Ukraine. So why why is Ukraine important in this way? Okay, so the, the, the big thing is you've got the Soviet Union back in the day, back in the days of the Cold War. In 1991, that breaks up and it breaks up into the Eastern Bloc of countries um, that you know, one of them being Ukraine, which is bordered to Belarus to the north, Russia to the east, and I believe it's Poland to the west. So it's fairly deep within that block of Eastern European countries uh, and clearly has a lot of big ties to the former Soviet Union. You know, with the big, the big drama that was on the telly, that big Chernobyl thing that happened, um, that was a real life thing, a real life nuclear power plant, although that was in the Soviet Union at the time, it's in modern day Ukraine. So, you know, big things have happened in this country and its history is, you know, a lot of its history, recent history is linked to Russia in a lot of ways. But in 1991, it gains independence and it breaks off. And that's when it starts to look for the West for guidance, as a lot of those Eastern European countries do. So they start to take break away from communism. They don't want to follow the old Soviet ways. They go into democracy and their first elections happen in 1994. Uh, as happens with like a lot of Eastern Bloc countries at the time, there are, there are allegations of corruption within those governments, particularly when it comes to the election and the people that you are voting for. So in Ukraine in 2004, we have the Orange Revolution. Uh, this is sparked by the fact that you've got a presidential election in which you've got Viktor Yushchenko, um, who is a candidate who is West-facing. Essentially, he's saying that he wants to side with those in the West for guidance, and that's where Ukraine will look to get its peace and prosperity. And uh, another candidate who wanted to look more to the East and to Russia for those same things, because you've got two big spheres of influence crashing here in the Ukraine. Um, Yushchenko was poisoned during that campaign, and although he recovered it was the essentially the, the candidate who was looking eastward who won that election and people felt that it was rigged, it was fraudulent in some way, and that's what sparked the Orange Revolution and that put Viktor Yushchenko in charge. So already back in 2004, you've got the sparks here where you've got a clear clash between East and West happening in the Ukraine and the West comes out on top but not directly. It's sort of as a result of a of a revolution and overthrowing of the government. Skip ahead to September 2003. You've got Viktor Yushchenko in charge. He's the guy who was looking for the West for guidance. He's meant to have a big conference, a big summit with the EU, saying that he's going to go ahead and look at Ukraine joining the EU. Um, the EU has a lot of Eastern Bloc countries already in it. You know, think of like Poland. That's the big one. Um, you know, Poland has a big border with Russia, but it's part of the EU. That's a clear sign that it's looking to the West for its sort of like economic and military security. The Ukraine says it wants to do this. However, at the last moment, Yushchenko pulls out and says, nah, actually, I think I'm going to side with Russia on this one. This is what sparks another wave of revolutions in the street. And you get a second revolution with Yushchenko this time being overthrown and a more pro-European leader put in charge. Now, it's this that sparks that first Crimea invasion in 2014. You might think back to that as something weird. Um, it was in the fact that it was sort of like a bloodless coup. Crimea had been part of the Ukraine um, for a while. And when the revolution was going on, Russia essentially took its chance to say, hey, we're going to step in and keep the peace in this region. 
essentially occupying it with unmarked soldiers and then forcing the occupants of that to partake in a referendum in which the result was that it handed control over to Russia. Um, So Russia and ex-Crimea back in 2014, um, even though that's not being internationally recognised by a whole load of countries. And as well as that, you have two breakaway states in the east that are Donetsk and Luhansk. That's where the major cities are in those two areas. Those become essentially the site of a Ukrainian civil war with with a Russian-backed insurgent there saying that they want to make this part of Ukraine Russian. So ever since 2014, for about the past eight years, there has been a clear tension between Ukraine, Russia and the West. And this fighting that's been going on in the eastern part of Ukraine hasn't really stopped. You've still got this standoff between these two regions. And that's the that's the background to that situation. So you can see that this is not something that Putin hasn't just woken up one morning and decided I would quite like to invade the Ukraine. It's got years of history and years of struggle between the two sides where it looks for for its influence. And clearly, Russia thinks that Ukraine integrating more into the West would be a threat to the Russian state. So yeah, that's the very that's the very long term view. Um, do you want to go on? I don't know if you've got anything to add to those points. Not really. I think this is very much a situation where you are going to be better read than I. <laughs> As you know, I'm 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 kind of the audience proxy in in this show. In that I ask uh, the the questions. I'm I'm not the person with the knowledge about a lot of this. I've heard a lot of the stuff you just touched on over the last few days because I've been listening to Ukraine Cast. I also listen to there's a very good episode of the Naked Pravda that uh, I'll put in the show notes. But yeah, I, I don't think I have anything specific to add. I think 2014 is probably when people who weren't very uh, switched on with politics uh, would have heard about these stories because of the annexation of Crimea. But that's actually you know, seven, eight years ago. So I think for a lot of people who kind of, you know, people probably forgot that Crimea was, you know, what was going on in Crimea, um, where it was kind of, people just kind of went, oh, it's part of Russia now, I guess. And and I think that's what's kind of different about this story. Yeah, I think we'll just, we'll, we'll get into that as we, we go further in to uh, this episode. But I think the thing we should touch on next is the person leading the country. So uh, I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong here, but Volodymyr Zelensky. Yes. So you've got Zelensky, who is, he's sort of like a very different breed of political leader. And he's somebody who's been in the news an awful lot recently and stands out as, you know, not your average politician. So I thought it was worth a while, you know, spending some time on him and and, and why he's so different. Uh, So he's elected back in 2019 and he's come from a non-political background. He did a degree in law, but he was primarily an actor and a comedian who starred in a TV comedy called Servant of the People, where he actually played the president of Ukraine. So it's slightly bizarre that you've got somebody who played the president uh, becoming your actual leader of your country. I'm trying to think of who's played the... It's like Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant is suddenly, I know he's not so much, (laughs) he's an actor, maybe not so much of a comedian, but him in love actually suddenly deciding, you know what, I might try my hand at this politics business and actually getting elected. Um, The reason why he gets elected is because, as as we've mentioned before, you've had two previous, you know, in the short history of Ukraine becoming a democratic uh, republic in that sense, you've had two revolutions, one in 2004 and one in 2014, all not only fighting over both East and West, also basically saying that there is a problem within Ukraine, that it's controlled by certain groups of oligarchs. It's not maybe 100% democratic. And he's going to be the one to come in and shake that up, be an outsider, be a populist candidate, and he'll be something different. And I believe he certainly has in his short time in charge. Uh, One of the things that he's done to combat the Russian threat, so he's come in and said, look, basically, I'm going to sort out this corruption problem, but also I'm going to end the war in the East. His solution to do that was to make closer ties with NATO and basically say that Russia won't fight with us if we've got the backing of NATO and all the Western powers. That would be a good way to go about it. So he had a meeting back with Joe Biden. April 2021, Biden basically said, yeah, we can look at speeding up the membership process. However, this kind of talk is what worries Russia. Clearly, as we've said, there's already that fight between West and East. And as we mentioned back in the what sparked the 2004 election was the Western leader being poisoned. So there is, you know, there's allegations of interference from Moscow there within that democratic process. There's going to be allegations that Russia will try and interfere in any process which brings NATO to its border with Europe. And that meeting in April and what's happened subsequently, that seems to be one of the reasons that Putin's kind of 
like justifying some of his moves towards invasion, or at least that's one of the many factors that's led him to act now and against this president. We're going to touch on this again in a, in a second. We're going to touch more a bit on on NATO and why Putin, why why that set Putin off, I guess, uh, in Ukraine. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think people who weren't aware of Zelensky, I think before this, I, I mean, I'd seen him a few times on things, possibly featured on John Oliver once or twice, um, you know, because they did a lot of stuff on like uh, Chechnya and, and Belarus and would then switch to. But here's someone in the region who's not like that. Up until the last few days, the only real thing I knew about him was that that anecdote about how he would had been an actor in a comedy show um, portraying the president and now is the president. So I think that was like the thing of note about him as far as I was concerned until uh, recently. But there's been a lot of him on social media the last few days because there's been rumors that, you know, he's died or he's been captured and stuff like that. And then he's like, no, here I am walking, walking around the center of Kiev being like, you know, I'm fine. And he he went to dressing in military fatigues as soon as the invasion started and things like this. And I think he's, I think maybe he surprised people because like you say, if he was an actor and he was, not only has he done a good job uh, up until now, but then I think people thought, you know, I think some people thought this invasion would already be over. And so by him being out there and being very good at social media and, and, and showing people what's going on and, and stuff like that, he has very much established himself as an important part of this invasion from the Ukrainian side. I totally agree. And he's become very much the face of Ukraine during this time. He's done some very moving speeches, sort of like in Ukrainian and Russian and in Belarusian, trying to, you know, get across his point of view. I think he's certainly winning the PR war, at least within the in the West, when it comes to how he's viewed. Uh, there have been stories that he was, you know, the, the US said, you know, do you want us to evacuate you from Kiev? And he's like, no, I'm going to stay here with my people, with my military. I'm going to be the one who, who fights back. And maybe that's just another sign that he is not your typical politician. Maybe the average politician might have been sensible and decided to take refuge in a in another country. The fact that he is so hands-on in this regard has certainly won him a lot of admirers from across across the world and across the, you know, all political spectrums, I think, at least within the West. Uh, so yeah, he's he's becoming a very impressive figure, at least at least for now, um, and certainly acting in a way that, yeah, like like I just said, I I don't think an average politician would offer to, you know, like work alongside their military like he is right now. So yeah, he's certainly he, quite an example. I'm seeing lots of things on Twitter basically by saying, you know, would you expect if James Corden became the prime minister, would you expect him to do the same? It's it's that kind of like bizarre feeling that you've got that this is a man who comes from a very different background and he's yeah thrown himself into it with with all this force and it's sort of like irresistible at the moment. Yeah, he is. He is the man. He's the, he's the face of that Ukrainian war effort. And like I said, I think he's certainly winning the PR war for now. So all of that said, this is all the setup. Um, Putin obviously has asked for an invasion. There was some weird speeches he gave just before it happened because, you know, people have been trying to de-escalate this. It, it's weird to say this wasn't a total surprise because I think we were shocked that an invasion actually started. Like We knew there were troops on the border and stuff like this. It's really interesting seeing how that stuff has been mapped out by like Twitter activity and stuff like this of Russian troops. So, you know, it, it's we knew there were 100,000 odd troops on the borders of Ukraine. But um, we probably, I, I mean, you know, we thought this would be this kind of thing where there'd be some bluster, there'd be some kind of concession because I think they were... I can't remember exactly what was agreed before this happened, but I, my understanding was that they were going to say, oh, Ukraine won't join uh, NATO or something like that. Or at least that's what Putin wanted. There were some discussions ongoing and then it's like suddenly an invasion. So um, how, how I mean, what has caused Putin to go in for this now, uh, as far as we can tell? And again, big pinch of salt here. We're guessing about, you know, uh, there's a lot of comment, commentary at the moment about why is Putin doing this? Um, how is he justifying this, etc. cetera? Um, but I guess this is our chance for, well, it's Rob's chance to give his thoughts on the matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so like you said, I don't think war was like inevitable in this sense. Um, you've mentioned about the, the troops being gathered on the border there and a lot of people outside didn't think that Putin would actually use them to invade. It's more of a bit of saber rattling, willy waving, whatever you want to call it. Him saying, look, I've got a really big army and I could do this if I want to. Don't make me do this. That's what people thought the presence of troops on the Ukrainian border meant. And looking at Ukraine geographically, um, particularly with annexed Crimea to the south, you've got Russia to the east, and you've got Belarus to the north, all of whom have got Russian troops in there. Ukraine is surrounded on three sides. So it's very easy for Russia to make incursions and 
surround towns very quickly if, if they so choose. So Putin was certainly in a strong position in, in, in that sense. Um, but the demands he was making, as soon as he got wind that Ukraine were trying to speed up uh, going in for NATO, one of his demands to sort of stop any potential of war was saying that, you know, he would have put demand that Ukraine never joins NATO, like never, ever, ever. Not that the process to get them entered is slowed down somewhat. No, he, he can't accept it. That's his red line. And the US refuses him on that point, essentially saying that they would be throwing a potential ally under the bus if they refuse the Ukraine to to get that kind of support, particularly when you've got huge armies amassing on your on your border. That's not a way good way to treat a potential ally. Um so talks go on and people aren't sure if Putin is going to go ahead or not. Uh, and then a few key things happen. So on February 21st, he said that he was going to move troops in to support the two breakaway regions. So up until this point, Russia had merely supplied the rebels within that area with equipment, as far as we know, and the ability to defend themselves against the Ukrainian army. On February 21st, he says no, that the Russian army will move in and occupy those areas as support, sort of, as he would class it, humanitarian aid, which you know, clearly not the case from a Western point of view, um, but that's how he's going to justify it. And then on the 24th, the day that he actually chooses to invade the Ukraine, he does a big speech to the nation in which he announces his reasons to go to war. So this is where I think there's a lot of speculation about why he goes on and why he does these things. The bizarre thing about this speech, there are some headlines on the in British media saying that Putin had gone full tonto, basically means that he's gone a bit mad. It was called unhinged by some news outlets. It is a particularly uh, visceral speech that is not the usual sort of like, you can have veiled threats in your language sometimes or have subtext to your big political speeches. Here, I think Putin is just saying the text or at least exactly what he thinks and the reason that he's going into Ukraine for. Um, he accuses Ukraine of a number of fictional crimes, like purely made up stuff. He accuses the Ukrainian government of performing a genocide in those two occupied areas, which I think we would all agree is quite like a strong word when there's like, they, they might be in a civil war, but there's certainly no evidence that sort of like mass killings have happened on that scale. So again, that seems like a fabricated response. Um, he's also claimed that Ukraine has a desire to build up its own nuclear arsenal. As a side point, Ukraine was once the home of around a third of Soviet missiles during that era. But as part of claiming their independence, they got rid of every single one of their nuclear weapons and have never said that they wanted to pursue making or, you know, containing or even having nuclear weapons as part of like, even if they were part of NATO, they weren't hold nuclear weapons there from the USA in their country as part of that. Uh, Putin has straight up said that that's what they want to do. So that's that's another lie. Uh, he's also accused the government of supporting nationalists and neo-Nazis within Ukraine. It's so weird given like, um, uh, like it, it's such a weird claim. It's a very, it's like the uh, claim you'd have in the middle of an internet argument. <laughs> this is just my opinion. It's like, <laughs> oh, you're actually Nazis. And it's like, <laughs> there's no, I mean, I'm sure you could find a neo-Nazi in the Ukraine. That's not what we're saying though like you know there are neo-nazis in many countries but like the idea that it's like a hotbed of nazism um you know given its history as a country but the other thing is say uh, president Zelensky is jewish the last person who's going to be in charge of a country where there's a hotbed of nazism is going to be a jewish person like it makes no sense it's like that's probably the weirdest claim putin's made as part of his kind of case for war and i just want to add here while i i've got <laughs> while i'm saying a few things i i, I have you see i assume you've seen the speech and but like it was just kind of weird where he had like his war cabinet in there kind of like well if we all do this together then you know everyone thinks you were in on this uh, yeah complicit and it was very straight it was very kind of strongman tactics but it was just a very surreal thing to watch obviously i can't speak russian so i had to look at translated versions of it but it is very weird yeah yeah no it is that, that that Nazi point, that's another point that's sort of brought up by there are various factions even within like Western media that bring up, you know, the all anti-imperialist wars are bad and that there are there are certain nationalistic elements within Ukraine that when you get to hard nationalism, as you say, that, that there are neo-Nazi groups within the Ukraine. But is the government supporting it? Is, you know, is this current president doing it? Certainly not. And he's not enforcing any of those wills on his people at all. So again, it's just, it's something that 
you know, I don't want to brush under the carpet because there are neo-Nazi groups within the Ukraine. But if they're backed officially by the Ukrainian government, no way, Jose. That is something that is completely sort of like in Putin's head. But it's it's a reason that he feels that it's something that, you know, there's a, there's a history behind it. There's We're talking about the geopolitical situation and how Russia feels it has some sort of like historical claim over the Ukraine, like it was part of the Soviet nation. And Putin, in a sense, feels that it always has been, and that is just Russian territory. That's why That's why he feels in these two rebel areas, like for years now, they've been handing out lots of Russian passports to people in those areas. So if troops ever went in and occupied it, a la Crimea, then he could say, look at all these Russian citizens I'm protecting. Look at all these Russian passport holders I'm protecting. These are Ukrainians in name only. I know them actually to be Russians. That's why I'm going in and, and doing that. And there was a lot of that in this speech as well, sort of saying that there's a history behind it. And who's the historical old enemy of, of Russia that he can call upon? Well, Nazis within World War II. There's, we fought them back then. Um, I need to go in and do a I think it was even mentioned in his speech that one of the reasons that the the old Soviet Union was betrayed by the Nazis in the past and why them they found themselves on the back foot back in the 1940s was because they'd allowed Germany to make the first move in breaking that pact and attacking them. Putin's mentality throughout this whole thing, and you, you've seen it in previous speeches before now, I think there was one back in, in 2015, where he quite blatantly says that, you know, if you want to, you know, if there's if conflict is inevitable, then you always want to make sure that you are the one to strike first. And it appears to me that he felt that conflict in Ukraine was inevitable in this case. And that's why he had to make the action to go into that territory, despite you know whatever his justification for it, he was always going to be the one to to jump in there first rather than Ukraine attacking Russia. Because, well, let's be honest, I don't think it would be a smart move for anybody in Ukraine to decide to invade Russia for a weird reason. Interesting as well, where we're talking about the uh, how Putin has justified things. Uh, I did mention earlier there's uh, The Naked Pravda I've been listening to. I've mentioned them before. Uh, they are English language reporting from within Russia. They did a really good episode, actually, when they got just declared foreign agents. So as part of the crackdown on um, like a free and fair media within Russia, basically anyone who received any donations from outside of the country was deemed a foreign agent and therefore comes under extra scrutiny. And they did a really good episode on that because they got made foreign agents. So it affected them and they could talk about it, you know, how bad that's been for them and how it's affecting and limiting their ability to, to share stuff. Um, but their most recent episode talks a lot about like Putin's view, because um, people often talk about World War II when they're talking about stuff like this, and there are reasons why that's the thing people jump to. But actually, the the point of that episode, the Naked Pravda, and go listen to it because it's going to explain better than I, is that more that actually Putin's reasons for doing stuff seem to be more um, tied to the kind of older idea of a Russian empire, kind of more around the 1900s, um, pre a lot of Russian history that happened in the early 1900s. But basically, there's this idea of like, Russia is the country that should be in charge of all these parts of the USSR. But it's not, you know, because that's how it was post World War Two. It's because of this idea that there should be this original Russian Empire uh, concept where everyone is Russian, like there is no Ukraine, as far as he's concerned, because they are just Russian citizens, as you say, over there. Um, and so that needs to be the state of things. I will share that in the show notes uh, so that people can go listen to it because it'll explain it way better than I just did. That was like my potted summary. Yeah, no, I think that's that's, that's very worthwhile adding. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, the only other thing I've got to add on that really is we've talked about NATO and its part that it's played in this or the alleged part. It's worth saying in the speech that Putin didn't kind of like lead with NATO as a reason. It's it's way down kind of his, his paragraph of stuff. But what he does say about NATO is it is a fact. So, so this is this is like quoting from him directly. Um, it is a fact that over the past thirty years we have been patiently trying to come to an agreement with the leading NATO countries regarding the principles of equal and indivisible security in Europe. In response to our proposals, we have invariably faced either cynical deception and lies, or attempts of pressure and blackmail, or the North Atlantic Alliance continued to expand despite our protests and concerns. We cannot stay idle and passively observe these developments. It would be an absolutely irresponsible thing for us to do. For our country, it is a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. It is not only a very real threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and to its sovereignty. There's a red line which we have spoken about on numerous occasions, and they have crossed it. So that is kind of Putin firmly laying the blame at NATO's door for, you know, he can't stand idly by in his own words and just let this happen. He needs to do something. And if the expansion of NATO is a red line that, you know, he, 
that he thinks that NATO is crossing when they say they want to bring Ukraine into the fold, uh, then that might be another one of the reasons that it's you know prompted this kind of response for him. He he certainly sees NATO as a as a key reason, and it's one that you can't brush aside. But it's clear that I don't think you can blame just like you can't put all the blame at NATO's door for for starting this. There is also a great element where Putin is clearly. Uh, wanting to take advantage of a situation in Ukraine and feels there is a historical right to that land as well, where he's willing to make up any sort of weird lie and spark any kind of like weird humanitarian crisis or like try and explain to the world that there is one there as a reason for him to go in and invade. And it, it appeared that appeared to many that once he'd made his mind up on that, there was no going back on it. And that's why the Putin regime is now heavily involved in that conflict, even though a lot maybe within within the country itself, we've seen lots of protests of Russians on the street saying no to war. We've had some high profile Russian athletes, I believe it was a tennis player the other day who they usually sign the camera before they go off the off the court. He basically said no to war and that's a that's a big thing to speak out in, in Russia against Putin. That's to a lot of people that's an incredibly brave thing to do. So yeah, it's not that the country necessarily agrees with him, but this is the message of the Putin regime and their goals and aims when they go into the Ukraine. And yeah, it's certainly once you've delivered a speech like that, it's very hard for Putin to come back from that and say that he is willing to go for for peace. And and that's why basically on the same day that he did that speech, that is when troops started going into the Ukraine and yeah, mounting their assault. So we've kind of explained why well, at least why Putin thinks this is justified. Obviously, Western powers disagree. Um, I think most, well, I mean, I, I imagine most of our listeners uh, also disagree, uh, if not all of them, uh, that this is a good thing. Um, and as, as I said earlier on, like, it feels, uh, this definitely feels closer to home. Not that, like, I, I remember, you know, being a bit worried when the Crimea annexation happened, but it did somehow, it did feel kind of further away. And even though Crimea was, it, well, is a part of Ukraine, um, that kind of, I don't know why it didn't hit home in the same way, whereas this definitely feels like something that's happening. I mean, it, it, it was bloodless, wasn't it, Crimea? Yes, yeah, yeah. It was just kind of like, oh, hey, these people really wanted to be in Russia um, and they weren't at all convinced by these men with guns over here. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I think that's the thing. It's like it's fighting in Europe and we haven't seen that uh, in a long time. A lot, uh, like the equivalent kind of level of uh, conflicts like this are things that happened when I was a child. So I just, you know, it definitely feels different. I guess, sorry, <laughs> sorry, this is just a, I just wanted to, to share some of my feelings. I think everyone is feeling a lot of feelings at the moment um, in a very news heavy week uh, and I've tried to not be watching the feeds all the time, but it is also hard to pull yourself away from something like this um, and, and being concerned about it. And we're a long way from Ukraine, but you know, it can still make you be worried and valid feeling that people have. What what has been the response to this? Because I think there's definitely talk now of whether Putin underestimated what the response would be. Like, you know, there hasn't been a Ukraine is defending itself. No, it's not like there's suddenly been an army deployed by the US or something like that, because that would be the start of like a true war between uh, Russia and the state. Um, but what have Western powers been doing this week? It's been a lot. Uh, in fact, stuff has been coming out as we've been talking. You mentioned uh, Swift and, and a few other things earlier on. But um, a few, I think as we started talking, there was an announcement from the EU. So where, where are we with regards to sanctions and other things? First of all, it's been widely condemned by like nearly all Western nations. Um, who have said that this is a bad thing? That's 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 the first step off mark. Well done. But then the next thing is people say, okay, you've you've said your intentions. Now what are you actually going to do to help Ukraine? So first of all, we've seen a number of nations take in uh, refugees that have been escaping Ukraine often out through Poland. That's the main route out of the country for a lot of people who fear they'd be they'd be trapped. Uh, there has been a variety of people within the EU saying they're willing to take various numbers of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, there is a little bit of dispute in the UK about how many we take. Um, in fact, people say that you can't get into the UK um, from Ukraine if you don't have a visa. And it was the suggestion on one of the work websites and even by one of the cabinet ministers that the way to apply for one of these visas would be like a work visa to apply to pick fruit in the fields, which led to a lot of people saying that like, no, you can't turn refugees into economic migrants. That that that's not how it works. So Britain's response to that has been muted, at least on the taking in of refugees. But like the rest of Europe appears to be stepping up and being willing to accept the hundreds of thousands of people that are now fleeing 
the Ukraine. Um, in a way of supporting those troops on the ground, you've got a lot of uh, places within Europe that are willing to sell um, arms to Ukraine to help keep them, you know, able to keep up the fight against the Russian troops. America's doing that. The UK has done that. And I think it was announced while we were on, on this podcast, or at least earlier this evening, that the EU has also agreed to um, sell arms to the Ukraine. So it appears that if the fight is prolonged, then the Ukrainian government will get a steady stream of arms to them to be able to repel the, the Russian invasion, which is certainly something that they need. You need those supply lines up and running and need your allies there to uh, to keep that fight going. What you've mentioned quite rightly at the start there is that no NATO power has agreed to directly and put boots on the ground or people within that country, because that's the, the big fear. The way that this gets out of control is if you have NATO, a Western superpower, fighting a Russian superpower, and both of those sides have nuclear weapons. For the time being, it's Ukraine that don't have any nuclear weapons against Russia, which is kind of the the rules of war as it is, you know, however bizarre it sounds, like the etiquette there is like, hey, you definitely don't use nukes in that situation, or you've certainly crossed the line. Like if Russia did that to a non-nuclear power, it would be seen as as, as, a, as a travesty, quite quite rightly so, but on a, on a lot of levels, the international community could not accept that. So that is why no member of NATO is going to is willing to take the risk of putting any boots on the ground, and I don't think that's a development that that will happen. That you will see members of NATO physically within the Ukraine, but they can keep those arms sales up there as well. Uh, other military news: you've got Germany as well that has pledged to increase its spending into NATO. And don't know if you remember this, but Donald Trump went over to Germany during his presidency and said, hey, you're not paying enough into NATO. You should up this. You should you should up this to 2% because America's kind of been covering all of you and, and making up the deficit, but everybody should pay their fair share. Germany refused to at the time. This has been the move that's made Germany of all countries decide that, yeah, we're going to pay more into our military and yeah, we're going to make sure we've got a strong NATO on, on the European continent, which is a lot of of people saying that that's something that Putin might not have guessed has happened. Like a stronger NATO is certainly not something that Putin wanted, you know, as a as a result of this. Uh, and maybe Putin thought that the relatively weak economic sanctions that came his way, that were, you know, a slap on the wrist for invading Crimea, he felt if that happened again, this was something that he could get away with it. But it does seem that all of the European powers in the West are drawing a line in the sand saying, no, we can't be as soft this time round. We have to enforce some pretty major economic sanctions as well to help you know if if you cripple the the Russian economy and the Russian people turn against Putin and see this as a fruitless war that's another way of putting pressure on Putin to make sure that he doesn't want to continue it and of course the longer the conflict in Ukraine is is dragged out the more that they can't take Kiev or, or, or key cities within Ukraine the longer that goes on and the longer those sanctions are imposed the less popular Putin gets within his own country what else we've got oh sorry just military wise it is worth saying that before war, war broke out China were at least sort of partly on the side of Russia or seemed to understand Russia's, you know, they seemed to understand Russia's point of view when it came to not expanding NATO or having NATO within Russia's sphere of influence. Um, as soon as Russia decided to invade the Ukraine, um, the UN decided to take a vote on whether this should be condemned. Uh, of course, Russia is one of the big countries on the UN Security Council because it has nuclear weapons. Uh, Russia voted against that, so there's no way the UN was going to be able to condemn it in its entirety. But significantly, China didn't vote with Russia. They remained neutral, which is essentially them voting against their partner in a way or showing that they don't have this tacit support of another of the other the third superpower that we've got in the world so it does seem that russia is particularly isolated when it comes to this yeah i don't know i know you said there are a lot of economic things going on what do you know about the economic side of stuff and and the the sanctions that start to be put in place certainly like the more recent ones so the thing we've been talking about a week was like sanctions and as i said you know it's not like suddenly there are nato troops turning up in ukraine because that would be a very significant change to what this is. Uh, at the moment, it's Russia is fighting Ukraine and the kind of ways that people are helping out, as you say, supplying weapons and arms and, and uh, uh, t directly to Ukraine, um, financial backing. Uh, there's been a lot of opportunities to donate money to the Ukrainian army that have been going around, for example. Um, but the big and most significant thing that's been being discussed is uh, banning Russia from SWIFT, 
uh, well, I, mean, I guess not everyone makes international payments, but when you have to fill out uh, international payments, you have, you have a thing called an IBAN number, which is like, I think, the, the general person equivalent of SWIFT, which is the international banking number that you get. Um, and I've had to do that a few times. Like, I have a, My brother lives in Japan. So, you know, I might have to send him money or something like that. You know, but the various situations, it doesn't come up super often, but it, you'll see it on your full bank statement. Normally, there's this big, long number, much longer than your normal uh, eight digit UK bank number. Um, and then Swift is like that, but it's interbank stuff. So it's big money transfers. And there is a very good NPR podcast on when uh, I think it was North Korea hacked into uh, a Indian bank that had access to the SWIFT network and managed to transfer funds away from this bank um, using the SWIFT network. It has, they've ranked up, uh, ranked up, they've uh, improved the security of SWIFT since then. Although, as it turns out, it wasn't actually that SWIFT itself was insecure. It's that the networks in the building that the SWIFT that the bank was in were insecure so people basically were you know it's, it's the kind of usual thing when a hack happens where actually you, you have all these sophisticated computer systems but it's you know someone having their password as password or something like that that brings you down um and it just kind of changed advice and training more than anything is my understanding so i'll share that podcast as well in the show notes um but uh yeah my understanding is uh, and i'll just bring up there was an article appeared on bbc news as we were starting the podcast um, but I, my understanding is that basically they're moving to ban Russia from SWIFT, which would mean no big international payments uh, into Russia. As we know from all our Brexit talks, the EU unanimously voting for something can take some time. There have been a few unanimous decisions uh, tonight from the EU. So I think that was one of them. Isn't it the banning of flights? Because the UK had already banned Aeroflot, is it? Or whatever the Russian sort of national airline is. They've now they've banned Russian airlines from airspace. Yes, they've banned all Russian. It's not just Rus Russian airlines. They've also banned, um, uh, they've banned um, basically any Russian owned plane. So the idea is that's more to target oligarchs, private jets than it is to target. Like it's quite easy to target individual airlines. They have to follow the rules, but this is like a, an extra step to take those down. Um, and then the other thing is they're moving to ban R Russia Today and Sputnik from being broadcast within the EU, uh, which are um, Russian news outlets. So, yeah, um, it's, uh, you know, w we've seen how long it can take the EU to come to a decision before um, with stuff around Brexit. There's a lot of negotiations. Obviously, in those situations, the deadline is just some arbitrary thing that Boris Johnson asked for or Theresa May asked for. It shows when they're of the same purpose, uh, how quickly the EU countries can agree on something, I guess. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a lot coming out from the EU this evening. Um, and yeah, it financially might not be as good for Russia as... Well, I mean, Putin will have known that there would be financial sanctions, but I think the, the general commentary seems to be the speed of these sanctions and how, how many they have been is maybe more than he had expected. There are funds that Russia has. Um, I've heard this phrase going around of Fortress Russia, where they have numbers of billions uh, in Russian funds. Um, but basically overseas funds that Russians have are being dropped, uh, seized, frozen, etc., etc., all over the place. So I think I think it may be going further than Putin anticipated. Um, well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, th I, th I think that's fair to say. I think that's what everyone is saying. Um, who knows more about this than me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I think you're right to point out the speed has probably shocked Putin because maybe, you, you know, one of the things about Putin being in charge of Russia is that, you know, he's clearly one man at the top, in charge, authoritarian regime. He makes the rules and when he makes a decision, bosh, it happens. OK, compare that to the West or how he might see the West. That is a conglomerate of countries that all need to be more democratic about it. They need to get together. They need to discuss it. There might be compromises. Things might get watered down. That's why he might anticipate that sanctions would have been far less severe. The fact that there is such a united front amongst like both from the West and from you know the United States as well, banning people from SWIFT, that was something that apparently Joe Biden was wavering on. Like, is that too severe? Was it had like some worries from people within like Germany and Italy? And in the end, they've all said, yes, we've got to act decisively now. We're in only the fourth day of conflict that it's happened. And four days in, they're banned from one of like the biggest international like ways of moving your money across the world. They're banned from a, a, a wide variety of sources of their money. And that's got to be something that maybe he couldn't prepare for. And how much can you compare, prepare for it in four days? You know, there's got to be limitations on that. So very impressed with the speed and what's happened. Those are kind of the big sanctions that have come from government 
I just wanted to touch on a few little points where, you know, you've you've got hard power like that coming from places like the EU, from the USA, the economic sanctions, the giving of weapons to Ukraine, that's all hard power. There's also been like a lot of soft power losses for Russia as well. So it, it sounds insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but stuff like F1, they're not doing a Russian Grand Prix this year until the conflict's over. They, they can't do that. The Champions League final has been moved from St. Petersburg, where it's meant to happen, back into, um, I think it's going to, to Paris now, it's going back into Central Europe. And you're seeing those old kind of like, when the Cold War ended, people tried to reintegrate with Russia. And even though there had been tensions within Putin in the past, you know, eight years since 2014, clearly people weren't happy about what happened in Crimea. There was still a Russian Grand Prix. There was still the, gosh, the the World Cup, 2016 or 2020? Uh, I mean, if it's a sport question, it's Cups. down to you, Rob. Not down, not down to me. I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to say 2016 and mess it up. But one of the one of the most recent World Cups was shared. You know, was put in Russia um, as one of them, and the entire world descended on that regime, and it did so fine. You had a Winter Olympics back in in Sochi that also happened like within Russia. Big global events. At the moment, they're being shut out of those one by one, and they're becoming quite isolated. the The only the only big sporting uh, organization, maybe not to be so harsh, is surprise, surprise, FIFA, who I have a lot of problems with anyway, given who they decide to give World Cups to, and they maybe not have the biggest history of transparency behind the scenes. Um, their announcement tonight is that Russia can't compete under their national flag or in the stadium, um, so it'll have to be played in neutral ground if they want to get qualification to the latest World Cup. The interesting thing that's happening there is that all the teams that were within Russia's group, a lot of the football associations are coming out and saying, we won't play Russia no matter what. We're not going to do it. Even if you don't have those flags, if you if they play in a neutral venue, I'm not playing Russia. They're essentially trying to freeze them out of the World Cup themselves before it happens. Now, FIFA could step in and award Russia a 3-0 win for every buy of every team that doesn't choose to play against them. Um, but that would certainly, I think, prove quite a PR disaster and be a bigger disaster for FIFA if they allowed that to happen. So yeah, the fact that the the Western world is so united and that's having an impact on major like sporting brands and those soft things, that shows that Russia clearly has like lost the PR battle with this one in a far greater way than you compare it to the Crimea annexation back in 2014. There weren't really that consequences for that one here. Here, people are really biting the bullet and they're biting it fast. And yeah, you've even had um, Roman Abramovich, who has connections with the Putin regime and like where he gets his funds from. He's had to step down as chairman of Chelsea FC to try and distance himself to make sure that Chelsea FC doesn't get wrapped up in all this controversy. So yeah, a lot of developments like that. And I suspect a few more will happen over the coming days. And that's a, just another way of like almost like culturally isolating Russia more from the world. And it'll be interesting to see what impact that has the longer it goes on yeah no i i mean this is the thing a, a lot of the talk about sanctions was this you know the, the the thing with sanctions is they generally affect the average person a lot of the sanctions that were initially being discussed were things like bans on imports and things like that which uh, we know from how that's played out with the us and iran that often that affects the average person on the street it does now sound like a lot more of these sanctions are kind of a bit more targeted towards you know the billionaires and and to people who may feel feel that around putin and uh, a lot of these people are often described as allies of putin so i wonder you know you have to wonder what that pressure will be on putin as all of his friends start being affected by these sanctions that does not mean however that these sanctions aren't going to affect the average Russian, and we should always uh, bear that in mind, because just because Putin decides to do something, that doesn't mean all of Russia is behind him in this. As you mentioned earlier, there's these. Uh, there have been protests. Uh, protesting in Russia is a really dangerous thing to do. Those people are very brave, and you know it's definitely not true that a lot of the Russian populace are behind this. But they're also being um, lied to in their state media, as we mentioned before. So uh, just want to make sure that's clear that you know it's not like you know th th there are, there will be people on the internet saying, oh, you know, Russians have had this coming, and it's like, well, it's not not fair the average person probably does not want to invade ukraine because you know they don't have any skin in that game really um you know that there may be i'm sure there are people on the street in the same way you know you had people who voted for brexit i'm sure there are people on the street who would say oh yeah no we should we should take back ukraine because they've heard all this propaganda saying that it, it's part of russia and it needs to come back into the fold putin is saying yeah it's going to be interesting to see how sanctions work but remember it's going to be tough times for russian people as well that this causes um and so hopefully those more targeted at like billionaire etc kind of um sanctions start to to make make it felt for putin quicker rather than later because otherwise you're looking at 
you know, hurting the Russian people enough that they then could rise up against this because this is the problem. But, you know, that that is the kind of thing that does not happen quickly, um, you know, e- even in a state where we, we suspect that uh, the elections may not be entirely above board, getting people to overturn uh, Putin is not something that would happen quickly, I don't think. Yeah, no, certainly. I, I, I agree. But it is at least it's a very good point you made there that this is like the Putin regime that's doing it. It's not all Russians. So the way that the rest of the yeah the Western world reacts to that and that you can take in those who, you know, might want to flee that Russian regime or whatever happens as a result of the protests or, you know, I'm not saying that people will overthrow the Putin regime from the inside. That seems to be something that Putin has shielded himself very well from. Um as you mentioned, if these sanctions are targeted against the oligarchs and against those in his inner circle, those might be the voices that persuade Putin to change his mind. But um, yeah, if some of the news conferences I've seen are to be believed and the way that he treats some of his internal ministers about if the decision to go to war is, is the right one, um, then yes, it's it's quite clear that Putin still has a great amount of power within within central Russia and within, that, uh, within the workings of, of the Russian government. There's no doubt that he's the one in charge. Yeah, I think, I mean, we have seen... Um oligarchs um, kind of kicked out of Russia before over falling out of Putin. I don't think we've necessarily had all of them turn on him at once, though, which is the kind of thing these kind of sanctions would try and encourage. Whether or not that actually happens is obviously, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But, you know, that's that's the idea. I mean, arguably, of course, if you seize all the assets of the oligarchs uh, outside of Russia, then they have a lot less power as well. So I guess, uh, yeah, Uh, not really something I can speculate on. I'm speculating now and I will stop. Did did you want to say anything kind of in, in summary? I think I don't really want to say anything in summary just because if you mentioned at the start, it's the situation is ever changing at the moment. So I don't want to make like any predictions for the future or or what happens. It's certainly one where you've got to keep looking at the day to day. I think the only person that I'd say is that at the start of this, part of me was worried that the invasion of Ukraine would be like over by now that the speed at which Russian forces could occupy that territory and the way they occupied Crimea, it happened very, very quickly and sort of happened so fast that the West didn't really have time to react to this. The fact that the Ukraine is putting up such a fight and is clearly slowing Russia down in its advance into that country and how long they can prolong this for, that might be, if Russia suddenly gets stuck in a, in a quagmire in this war and it's one that it finds itself, it's a war that it is unable to to win, that's when, again, that might be the other thing that persuades Putin to, to pull out when he thinks that this, is, this is, isn't this is just a quick win, I've got Ukraine, everybody can move on like it was in Crimea. Um, yeah, if it, if it extends for weeks or months, then that's when it starts to get like particularly messy for Russia. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in those coming week and months and how both that the military side progresses and the economic side progresses as a result. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have anything to add. I don't think you've given me far more information than I had before. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, if I was to give a summary, like it's fluid, it's happening, it's it's nearer to home than other things. That does not mean um, like, you know, I can understand why people may be, may be worried because this feels like something different to things we've experienced during our lifetime um but you know take a break hydrate don't spend all day doom scrolling the news um yeah i I think that's the thing to take away from this it's it is a bad situation we i hope we've treated this with enough seriousness today um and i think yeah it's just could the world not for a bit would be my my set you know we've just like we're talking about you know ending mask mandates and stuff in the uk and Literally on the day that those mask mandates were lifted was the day that Russia invaded Ukraine. It felt to me like we were literally going from COVID's over to, oh, now you've got this war to, to deal with. And yeah, you're right. Like, can we just not, can the world not be on fire for just five minutes, please? <laughs> I've seen enough memes going around recently, which is kind of like, I'm kind of tired of living through major historical events. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that especially those of us who grew up in the, the 90s had a very good time to be growing up where, you know, money went up, uh, savings were good, life was fairly stable, at least in the UK. America, I think, was in a similar position where it kind of felt like everything was great. You know, we didn't yet, we weren't really worrying about climate change yet, even though it was obviously on the horizon um, and scientists were worrying about it. But yeah, and part of that obviously is we were children at the time. So we weren't paying attention to all the bad news and as you grow up there's something you have to deal with but yeah it does kind of feel like there's been an awful lot in the last few years and it'd be nice if the speed of news did slightly slow down obviously it'd be great uh i saw a thing earlier saying maybe there's going to be talks now between ukraine and russia it'd be good if that that does lead to something um because obviously we don't want this to carry on all the stuff we talked about you know sanctions and stuff i'm sure you know i'm sure most people well 
I keep saying most people because I want to kind of couch things, but I'd like to think all reasonable thinking people would not want to have to impose uh, sanctions on the average Russian either. Like that's just a thing that is unfortunately a consequence of having to do these kind of sanctions and stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, you can tell I'm struggling to word all of this, but um, it's yeah, it's a tough time. We, we would like this to be over as quickly as possible, but not in a way where it's like oh, well, Russia just takes over Ukraine. Like, so it's when you say you want it to be over as quickly as possible, it's like within a certain set of parameters, uh, which it doesn't necessarily sound it's going towards at the moment. So, um, yeah, ho hopefully, you know, there can be, you know, su maybe surprisingly peace talks between Ukraine and Russia will go better than we expect. But at the moment, it's very hard when you're in the middle of these stories to, to, to kind of see the way out a bit like how we've been stuck in the middle of the pandemic for the last two years and you're kind of like well this will end eventually but i can't really see too much light on the horizon uh, that's a bit depressing but uh, <laughs> i guess this is just like a stream of consciousness about my feelings um which we don't normally do on the show but uh yeah it sucks um and hopefully it ends soon but in a nice way as nice a way as possible obviously it can't end nicely because it's already started but yeah <laughs> i don't know how better to put that sentiment really so i'll leave it there um Rob, as ever, thank you for joining me and uh, giving me your insight into the news. Definitely a uh, useful background for me on, on Ukraine that I didn't know. And as always, you can find us in all the usual places. You can find us on Facebook as Unparliamentary Language. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Unpal Podcast. And you can find us on Reddit at forward slash r forward slash unparliamentary. And if you think uh, the reporting we do, the show we do is worth supporting, you can throw uh, become a Patreon for as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com forward slash TTSS um, to throw a little money out of way to help support the costs of editing, the microphones, uh, running the podcast and everything. But as we've done a few times when we've had shows like this, uh, when something big is going on, if if you if you you know if you've got that spare money, I'd much rather you gave it to people in Ukraine uh, to charities uh, that are supporting people in Ukraine right now. So um, you know we will survive. <laughs> We're just a a little hobby podcast. If you have that spare money, put it to a good cause. That would be my uh, recommendation. There is nothing left for me to say other than it's good night from me and it's good night from him. Bye 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 bye. bye. Good evening and welcome to the bar. Join Dr. Wilco as he investigates the histories of your favourite spirits and your favourite cocktails while mixing you a drink at the bar. The other bars may be closed, but a podcast bar will always remain open. <laughs>